Before we get started, here is what is made available to you by the fact that this video is on YouTube. It's a high-tech prosthesis. First, if things move too slow or too fast, you can pause, go back, or adjust the video speed. Some students watch at 0.75 times speed, which would be absolute torture for plenty of other students, including myself. I tend to engage with YouTube at double speed. And the general guidance for those looking to get the most out of this video would likely be copied over from reading best practices, namely, watch first at a fast pace, building your understanding for the framework and the overall design and ideas, and then go back and more deliberately or carefully attend to the details the second time, looking for apparent contradictions, which tend to be misunderstandings, and seeing where the analogies are incomplete or what was not said, perhaps on purpose. In addition to speed control, YouTube auto-generates very good subtitles, which occasionally make for good comedy, but I would say are more than 95% accurate. It also makes transcripts for you, which you can copy and paste and pretend that you made your own notes. The comments section also tends to be a better place than the course's learning management software to comment on or start discussions about lecture content because you can comment as you watch and leave timestamps so people know what you're referring to. One of my favorite features of YouTube is the kind people who comment helpful timestamps for the benefit of other watchers or for the benefit of me so I know what their comment is actually referring to. Over here is where you can make me feel good about spending time making watchable videos rather than teaching my kids things. Unreinforced behavior becomes extinct, and when we don't participate in the social sphere, the most pathological voices take over. Common sense is not dead, it's just quiet, so maybe murmur a bit. If you don't have a YouTube account, please take the 180 seconds required to make one, if only so that you can participate in this minimal way. Three, two, one, zero. This is Psychology of Thinking, the course dedicated to metacognition. Knowing that we know his methods, he will alter them. But, knowing that he knows that we know that he knows, he might choose to return to his usual pattern. Our thinking about thinking. According to ancient philosophy, one's mind performs three different acts. Understanding, reasoning, and judging. Or, more familiarly, thinking, reasoning, and deciding. The content of this course has been chosen based on its usefulness for personal and professional life. In a nutshell, the mind is a mess of processes, most of which become active without our consent or even awareness. An example of activation without our consent would be earworms or jingles. I don't need to finish the jingle, you know the rest. Did you consent to your brain finishing the rest of that jingle? No, it was something that was put in your head through repetition. Not because it's useful to you, but because it's sticky. An example of an earworm, or at least one that worked for me. I have a pen. I have an apple. Uh, apple pen. I have a pen. I have pineapple. Uh, pineapple pen. Apple pen. Pineapple pen. Why does that work for me? I don't know, but since 2016, every once in a while that will pop into my head. I don't mind when it does, but I certainly don't intend for it to. An example of activation of your mind without your awareness would be the many mistakes that we make especially if we're tired. You go to put something away in the cupboard, but you find yourself opening the fridge to put it in there. Most of the time, these automatic processes work, so we don't notice them, and that's the point. The point here is not that earworms and procedural autopilot exist. You already know that because you've observed yourself making mistakes, like walking into the bathroom to brush your teeth, but finding yourself washing your hands instead, or being driven nuts by the urge to sing Justin Bieber's song, Baby. The point is that this is how all of our thinking actually works. Circumstances activate our habits of mind, our feelings, our analogies, and our association networks, and one of the activated things is a self-explainer that convinces you most of the time that you are thinking all of these things on purpose. The self-explainer is not entirely wrong, but the observation that much of what you think and do is 
actually unintended or reasoned through afterward can open doors to understanding yourself that you had no idea existed. I'm trying to free your mind, Neo. But I can only show you the door. You're the one that has to walk through it. So the Course is going to walk us through all three acts of the mind from ancient philosophy. First, the act of understanding. You could more simply call this thinking, or you could get fancy and philosophical and call it apperception, like Immanuel Kant and Wilhelm Wundt, but we'll mostly just call it thinking. That's the first third of the course. It's a little more than a third of the course, but it's the first section, the first of three sections of the course. The second section is formal reasoning or logical reasoning. Everybody makes appeals to being logical or using logic. We're going to find out what that ideal actually refers to and how to use it to understand arguments, to make better ones, and arguably, most importantly, to catch ourselves when we are misusing our reasoning. The final third of the course is about judging. In the real world, everything comes with uncertainty understanding how to work within uncertainty rather than ignoring it or treating all uncertainty the same is hopefully one of the things that you take away from this course this final third will be the more advanced applications of the basic concepts we cover in the first third but they will still be basic concepts we all think we're pretty good at using basic things like pens and magazines and then we watch Jason Bourne and we're like oh there's a basic thing and you can use it for some pretty awesome stuff like defending your girlfriend when there's an assassin in your apartment so without further ado psychology of thinking lecture one today rules that your brain seems to follow or features of your brain that could in some cases be bugs First things first, the received wisdom or conventional wisdom surrounding first impressions is accurate. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. First impressions stick. The first few seconds are vital, etc. This holds up in cognitive psychology paradigms, wherein the first few seconds are the most important seconds in determining how you will feel about someone, judgments you will make about that individual, whether you will trust them, fear them, treat what they say charitably, look for strengths versus flaws in what they say, try to make sense or try to make nonsense of their actions, try to support and validate or shut down or avoid their feelings. First impressions are made quickly. We measure the time it takes to make a lasting first impression in seconds or milliseconds in psychology. One commonly taught example of first impressions is a study that got undergraduate students to rate the competence of their professors, how well they taught, whether they seemed to have a mastery of the subject matter, etc. While in some cases they were having students watch an hour or two of a videotaped lecture in order to come to their decision, measurement of those impressions at different time periods in the videotaped lecture showed that student ratings don't seem to change much over the course of the lecture. There were a few different studies and setups used, but the bottom line was ratings of the professor's competence will not change after about 30 seconds of watching. And, as if that weren't enough, those first 30 seconds are mostly determined by the first 3 to 5 seconds. In other words, students' assessments of their professor's competence or at least the professor in the study, were formed in the first few seconds, and any change after that time was rather insignificant. In laboratory paradigms, what we will do is we will intentionally create a negative or a positive first impression that is later contradicted by future revelations about the individual. Despite this important change in what is in front of people, the first impressions seem to stick and participants don't change their first impression nearly as much as they should. Or put another way, they persist in putting far too much weight or stock or emphasis on the first few seconds of learning about the person. In these paradigms where we give people clear reasons to change their first impressions, we find that to the extent that the first impressions change, it is far easier to get an initial positive impression changed to a more negative impression than it is to get an initial negative impression changed to a more positive impression. And this makes good adaptive sense. If somebody hurts you, scares you, confuses you, or elsewise sets off alarm bells, 
it is likely adaptive to not forget that. So as depressing as this may sound, a negative first impression is the one least likely to change. As with most robust findings in psychology, there have been people that have looked at sex differences, and in this case they found some. When we ask people about their impressions of other individuals, we find that males tend to be harsher or less positive in their assessment of other individuals than females. So when we're asking people to rate strangers or people they just got acquainted with in terms of how humorous or how interesting, intelligent, attractive, tolerant, authentic, manipulative we think they might be, males tend to rate people less positively across the board compared to females. But this favor is paid back because individuals of either sex when they are judging males rather than females tend to be harsher in their assessments. In other words, the average male who is being judged will be judged more harshly than the average female, and this is true regardless of the sex of the judger. So in the first impressions literature, you would seem to fare best if you were a female being judged by females, and worst if you were a male being judged by males. But these are, of course, average differences, which may be more or less important in any given situation that you might want to predict. And these differences are rather minor when held up against the overall effect of interest here that first impressions don't seem to change much, regardless of which sex one is or which one is judging. So what likely came to mind when we were discussing first impressions initially it was attractiveness. We judge the attractiveness of others rather automatically. Different groups of individuals will tend to judge the attractiveness of individuals similarly. In other words, if I give you 100 faces to judge the attractiveness of, your top 10 and your bottom 10 will mostly correspond with the top 10 and bottom 10 of others assessing the same set of 100 faces. Moreover, this is an automatic process. We do not need a lot of time to make these assessments. Strongly related to subjectively perceived attractiveness are confidence, physical fitness, and similarity. In other words, someone who is more confident will be seen as more attractive, and someone who is more attractive will be seen as more confident. Someone who is more physically fit will be seen as more attractive. Someone who is more attractive will be seen as more physically fit. Someone who is more similar to you is more likely to be seen as attractive by you. And someone who is attractive to you, you might rate as more similar to yourself. And that last one could be in part because we tend not to have accurate views of our own image. The attractiveness and first impression studies tend to get rather depressing as we see just how shallow our automatic processing systems are. Reliable differences in attractiveness ratings can be garnered by digitally editing pictures so that they are barely above the just noticeable difference threshold of human perception. These two faces are significantly different that people would be able to tell them apart more than half of the time. In other words, most of you will agree that the two faces are different, but hopefully most of you would also agree that they are different to a trivial extent. Which of these two faces gets rated as more attractive? It will also be rated as more competent, more trustworthy, less likely to become aggressive, etc. Which of the two phases is it? In class, most students do not respond to this question, but of those that do, there's about 10 to 1 who say it's the face on the right. That's correct. Depending on how tall the model for this photo was, the face on the right represents a reduction by about 10, maybe 20 pounds. That's the digital difference. The same effects are found with female faces, and I've also run some informal experiments in class, and if I show people these faces out of context, students will generally have nicer things to say about the faces on the right. Last term I had a student in the front row, and she said that the man on the right had kinder eyes than the man on the left. A student said that she thought the female face on the left seemed more tired. The point here is just that this is how small of a difference it takes to get reliable differences in first impression ratings of attractiveness, competence, trustworthiness, etc. Interestingly, 
we tend to be more correct about individuals that we have more positive first impressions. But accuracy is in quotes here because this is the paradigm in which we found these results. If I get you to rate how attractive you think you are and then give your picture to a bunch of other people so that they can rate your attractiveness, if your picture gives people a positive feeling, they will rate your attractiveness closer to the score that you had, or rather the score that you gave yourself on attractiveness. The simple explanation here is that you likely rate yourself a little high, and with a positively valent first impression, others likely similarly rate you high. But since attractiveness and the positive valence of a first impression are so intertwined together, it may not seem like that's revealing anything interesting. Where the literature tends to get a little more interesting and less intuitive, a little more nuanced, is in liking. Specifically, let's take an example. I show you images of people and you rate them based on their trustworthiness. And maybe you find out that some of the people you rated as trustworthy did the right thing, and some of the people you rated as less trustworthy did bad things. Which people are you going to like more? The answer seems to be the people that you were right about. So you'll obviously like the people that you thought were good and did good things. And you'll obviously dislike the people that you thought were good but did bad things. But how do we rank the other two categories? Of the people that you thought were bad, will you like more the people who were bad or the people that turned out to be good? Well, it turns out we like being correct so much that on average, we prefer the individuals who we predicted were untrustworthy and turned out to be untrustworthy to the individuals that we predicted were untrustworthy but were trustworthy. Once again, these are average differences in rather artificial laboratory paradigms. But there might be an insight here that's useful to you. With first impressions, intuitions about how accurate our first impressions are have a little bit of truth to them. What does this mean? If I get you to assess someone and I say, okay, judge how trustworthy, intelligent, and reliable these individuals are. And accuracy in this case is just going to be the agreement of your rating with the individual's rating of themselves. If I ask a second question, so after I have you guess the person's intelligence, I say, how sure are you? your rating of your subjective confidence will be negatively correlated with the distance of your score to theirs. I.e., as your subjective confidence in your first impression accuracy increases, the error, or the distance between your guess and their actual value, decreases. So if you ask yourself that second question about how accurate you think your first impression is, then you can expect there to be some value in that assessment i.e. more confidence seems to indicate more accuracy, less confidence seems to indicate less accuracy, on average, overall. So if we are making, if we are establishing first impressions about people based on seconds of interaction, then what are we basing these impressions on? We are not basing them on the things that we typically tend to think are very important. So when you are walking into a meeting or when you are about to introduce yourself to someone, your thoughts about yourself may be on a wisp of hair that may be out of place, the quality of the knot of the tie that you tied, whether you showed enough or too much teeth in the smile that you're putting on, but it turns out that these finer grained details, these more specific things that we tend to occupy our mind with when we're thinking about whether we're making a good impression, are not what the other people are basing that impression on. So while you are thinking about that hair that may be out of place or whether the dimple in your wins or not is nicely in the middle, the people you're trying to impress are reacting to broader details about yourself. How tall you are, whether or not you have glasses, the symmetry of your face, and one thing that we've researched quite a bit, whether your face looks like a baby's face. As you may have observed in your life, babies have a way of hacking our brains. Most of us with a pulse and two neurons will melt just a little bit when we see a baby. Maybe this is subtle, so we see the baby and we give a little smile when we were not in the mood to smile previously. Or maybe just a raise of an eyebrow in an acknowledgement of the baby's innocence. Or maybe we melt a bit more dramatically and actually devolve into a puddle of incoherent baby talk and attempts to make it smile. Now it's a very good thing from an evolutionary standpoint 
that babies invoke this non-consensual response from us, i.e. that we do not have to reason out why one might want to care for a baby. The baby survives by making us want to care for it, and we survive as a species by being vulnerable to its hack of our system. But unfortunately, the features that babies and puppies and other small things with round faces and contrasting features, more specifically round faces with high arched eyebrows and a narrow chin, and features that contrast like big eyes and a small nose. Unfortunately, these features can be shared or possessed by grown people. So someone who is 40, who has high eyebrows, a narrow chin, a round face, big eyes, and a small nose, can evoke at least part of the response in you that a baby does, and make you more likely to like them, more likely to care for them, more likely to think they're innocent, and less likely to think that they could possibly be aggressive against you. If you wanted to engineer in a lab a human that would make the best first impression, you would give them a symmetrical face with baby-like features. If by now your thoughts have included something along the lines of these are not reasonable ways to make a decision, or we shouldn't be giving first impressions or appearances any weight at all, or, if I knew about these biases, then I probably wouldn't have them because I could adjust for them. Then you've started thinking in terms of System 1 and System 2. Explanations of human behavior have the challenge of explaining human self-contradiction. Someone says that what they want more than anything is to quit smoking for the health of their baby, yet they repeatedly go back to smoking. We personally find violence abhorrent, but we also find ourselves thinking of punching people in the face. We prefer coffee over tea, and tea over espresso, but espresso over coffee. Uh, or, more importantly, we would rather date John than Martin, and we'd rather date Martin than Justin, but somehow we prefer Justin over John. Do we contradict ourselves? Very well, then, we contradict ourselves. We are large, we contain multitudes. Multiple memes, multiple metaphors, multiple analogies, multiple mental models, multiple systems of mindware, multiple theories, multiple contrasting experiences from which we've learned. But this presents us with a challenge if we are trying to understand people. They contradict themselves. So, generally, if we're making a theory of human psychology, human behavior, it's going to be a theory that somehow parses or splits up the individual. So Freud famously split our psyche up into unconscious and conscious parts. There were a few other distinctions, like the preconscious and id ego, super ego, but he had to split us up. And he was just continuing a much older game, which says there's good and evil in the world, which was us trying to explain ourselves to ourselves. Evolutionary theory splits our brain up into modules, so you have different adaptive modules for the different emotions, for example. And dual process theory, which we'll be using quite a bit in this course, splits us up by saying that we have two systems, or rather we behave as if there are two different characters within us, two different explanatory systems seem to be well evidenced by our behavior. And these are the well-named System 1 and System 2. An example to show us how dual process theory works. Here's a question, and as with all questions I posit, it's not about getting the correct answer. It's about understanding your thinking, how you work your way to whatever conclusion you come to. I don't care what your answer is. I care about your being able to reflect on your process of thinking. A bat and a ball together cost one dollar and ten cents. The bat costs one dollar more than the ball. The question to you is how much does the ball cost? The best pedagogical practice here would be to ask you to write down your answer. There are huge benefits to making thinking visible because what happens is once you find out the answer, hindsight bias kicks in, and your brain works very hard to deny that you ever had the wrong answer or the wrong process in your head.
many of us stay even a step ahead by preventing ourselves from coming to a conclusion at all so that we get to say we weren't wrong. What I would like you to do is just to answer the question, or rather do the thinking and examine your thinking as you try to come up with the answer. When I put this question to a class of 65 students, most don't respond, but of those who do, 80 or 90 percent say obviously the ball costs 10 cents. If you came to that conclusion, then let's check your math really quick. The ball costs 10 cents. The bat costs one dollar more than the ball, so the bat would cost one dollar and ten cents. So you add up the cost of the bat, which is one dollar and ten cents, and the ball, which is ten cents, and that's a dollar twenty. The answer that most students come to is wrong. Of course, ten or twenty percent of students do get it correct, in part because they first come up with the wrong answer, and then they check their math, and then they go back and they say, oh, what would it take to get the correct answer? If the ball costs five cents, then the bat would cost one dollar and five cents. And if you added one dollar and five cents to five cents, you would have one dollar and ten cents, which is what they're supposed to cost together. The knee-jerk reaction of saying, well, the ball clearly costs ten cents, is your system one working. Your system one says, uh-oh, here comes math. What are some quick copy-paste methods that I could use to get the math away from me? It feeds some suggestions to System 2, which is your more deliberative, slower-thinking, check-your-work type of system. But System 2 is supremely lazy and mostly just rubber stamps whatever System 1 gives it. So many of you end up saying with confidence that the ball clearly costs 10 cents. And you're in good company. On campuses of MIT, Harvard, and Princeton, more than half of students answered this question incorrectly. At universities a little more like ours, 80%. So it seems quite natural to us to take the lazy way of answering without actually figuring out the question. And we blame this on two things. First, we blame it on our system one, which is responsible for most of our decisions. It would be exhausting if we had to deliberate and put together formal arguments for all of the decisions we made throughout the course of the day. System 1 just handles automatically most of the decisions we need. It works quickly. It judges things based on how they feel, what things are associated with them, logically or not. And it tries to go for the intuitive answer to a problem. It sees $1.10 and then it sees $1 and it says, oh, the answer is probably $0.10. Cents. Why? Because those elements are there. It feels like that should be the solution, and that's enough for System 1. But like I said, we blame it on two things. Sure, it's the fact that System 1 is quick and dirty, but there's also the fact that System 2 is lazy. So your more analytic system, the one that's capable of actually checking your work, is not, in the case of most students, doing its job. It's lazy, just rubber stamping the suggestions that System 1 made. So by dual process theory, you are vast, you contain multitudes, but specifically with regards to thinking, you contain two systems, a quick and dirty holistic associative system and a slow, deliberate, traceable, rule-based type of system. Your system one solves problems based on how similar they are to other problems. I usually sum up system one processes as copy-paste. What have I encountered that feels similar? Well, what did I do there? Just do that again. Which of those copy-paste solutions are available to you is going to depend on your prior personal experience and it'll reproduce those prior solutions. System 1 requires way less effort than System 2 in part because the test for System 1 is just what feels right. Now pragmatically System 2 could jump in at any time and start to apply its vast knowledge of grade 3 math word problems but it doesn't. It takes a Herculean effort to get System 2 to do its job. If you've had to take statistics in university, you are aware of this Herculean effort. Because unlike a lot of other courses in psychology, you can't skim your way through it. So System 2 uses the tools that culture gives us. Language, logic, mathematics, the manipulation of symbols and abstractions. It gives us formal analysis that can be traced. So if System 1 gave us a quick and dirty, copy-paste, intuitive type of answer, System 2 can check it. It can say, does it scan? Is it defensible? 
But since System 2 is so lazy, so reluctant to get involved, and meet this high bar, it's going to take what we generally call self-control. What does your body scream at you to do when you open up your statistics textbook? It screams, I need a tea. I need to go to the washroom. I should check my email. I'd study better if I went for a walk first. I should sharpen my pencil or finish three or four seasons of Breaking Bad. The laziness of System 2 saves us time because for the most part, System 1 handles things correctly. But if we could wake up System 2, it can start to build deliberate habits that end up getting funneled into System 1. But we can only improve those System 1 fast and dirty, copy and paste, intuitive, heuristic, holistic processes by getting the experience of deliberate work by System 2. What are some tricks that your brain seems to use in order to save time, energy, and effort? A name for these tricks is heuristics, shortcuts or rules of thumb that your brain seems to follow. Now these are not necessarily deliberate rules that you follow. These are rather observed implicit rules that your behavior or your conclusions or your decisions imply that you followed. That is, people predictably tackle problems in a certain way, implying that they're using these rules. One of the broadest of these rules is the availability heuristic. Before defining it, let's take an example. And again, Whenever I give you an example, I don't care what your answer is. I care about you tracing how you solve the problem. And what does your brain have to do to address it? Here's the question. Who has more money? Donald Trump or Arthur Chandling? You don't get any other information other than that. How do you come to an answer? When I present this to a class of 65 students, Nearly everybody says, well, I choose Donald Trump because I know he has a few billion dollars, and I'm not quite sure who Arthur Chandling is. Though there is a minority of students who say they choose Arthur Chandling either because they think I'm trying to trick them, or because he sounds like he has a fancy rich person's name. And there's a reason for him sounding like he has a fancy rich person's name, and that's because I made the name up in order to sound like a rich person's name. One student googled it, and it turns out that there's a jazz musician named Arthur Chandling, but I highly doubt that any jazz musician has however many billion dollars it would take to be richer than Donald Trump. The point here is, it was adaptive for you, or it was useful for you, to overweight the information that you had. So the little bit of information you had, which is, well, I've heard of Donald Trump, and I do know that he has money. Your brain said, well, it's probably relevant that I've only heard of Trump, therefore I'm going to choose Trump and say he is richer than Arthur Chandling. In this case, this availability heuristic got you the correct answer. Let's do another round of who has more money. Donald Trump again, or Lelaine Betancourt. Again, the issue is, how can you solve this problem? You don't have a lot of options. This is where, once again, most of the class of 65 students say, well, we'd kind of be forced to go with Donald Trump because we've never heard of Lilane Betancourt. But in this case, it turns out that... Le <clears throat> but in this case, it turns out that the late Lilane Betancourt, who died in 2017, was the 14th richest person in the world when she died, and she had much more money than Donald Trump. I would argue that in a question situation like this, the availability heuristic is likely going to give you the correct answer most of the time. It doesn't mean we should really have any confidence in our answer, because if we're making a decision between two things and we know nothing about one of the things, it's probably not a solid decision. But we're put in quite a bind by the question itself, a bind from which the availability heuristic saves us. Another example from the literature that first showed the availability heuristic, or first demonstrated the availability heuristic, is this: the following question. And again, I don't really care about your answer. It's how do you come to the answer for this question? Reflect upon your thinking. Are there more words that start with K, or more words that have K as the third letter? And this is in English. Again, you have two options, but in this case, you actually know quite a bit about both categories. 
you know a heck of a lot of English words. You know a lot of English words that start with K and a lot of English words that have K as their third letter. But there's a computational difference between when your brain has to think of words that start with K versus that have K as the third letter. That is, it's easier for your brain to come up with examples of words that start with K and more cognitive effort to come up with words that have K as their third letter. Kitten, kite, kangaroo, koala, kick, knuckle, knowledge, kill, acknowledge, bike, like, uh, tyke, rake, bake, cake, lake. Now, most individuals including nearly all of the students when I do this in class, will say that there are more words in the English language that start with the letter K, and most will be quite confident. But your brain is in part giving you that solution based on its assumption that the ease of coming up with le words that start with K is somehow useful or significant or relevant to the question of whether or not there are more of them. Your system isn't quite smart enough to adjust for the fact that it takes more cognitive effort to come up with words that have K as the third letter. So the availability heuristic here is saying, well, I have more words that start with K available to me. That must be a useful bit of information. That availability must be important in me coming to my conclusion. So it decides that the thing that's easier to come up with is the more common thing, or more numerous thing. It's not a terrible shortcut. According to the website bestwordlist.com, which exists to help you find good high-scoring Scrabble words, mostly, there are just over 3,000 words that start with K, and just over 1,500 words that have K as the third letter. So that's the feel and flavor of the availability heuristic, which is defined as roughly this. We overvalue information that comes to mind more easily. It's not just that we use available information. Of course we use available information. That's happening all the time. The availability heuristic says we overvalue that which comes to mind more easily. We treat it as important that we have heard of Donald Trump. We treat it as relevant that we can more easily come up with K as the first letter words. Another example, just to cover lots of bases, would be the question, are you more likely to die due to violence or due to an accident? And this is one that surprises me, but apparently most people think they're more likely to die or be injured via someone being violent against them than from being in an accident. This is not true, but in part because violence is salient, it's visceral, and you can think of news stories about violence likely more readily than you can think of cases of death or serious injury due to accidents. This one is explained mostly in terms of salience. It captures our attention and our imagination, which might also be why there's such a fear of shark attacks, despite low prevalence. This next example is an experiment that you can run at home, either with you and someone else you live with, or you can ask two people that live together. You get one person to say what percent of the household chores they do, and required here is the fact that there's only two people doing the chores. It could work. What you need is you just need exhaustivity, so you need to ask everyone who contributes to the chores what percent of the chores they think they do. So for the sake of the example, let's say there's two people who do the chores, ask person one privately so the other person can't hear them what percent of the chores do you think that you do around here let's keep it more specific uh, what how what percentage of the dirty dishes that get washed do you wash and then you, you have that person score and you go to the other person and you say okay what percent of the dishes that get washed do you wash now you have two numbers and if the individuals are accurate about their percentages, then those two numbers will sum to 100. But of course, they almost never do. Even my wife and I, who both know how this experiment or how this bias works, have never landed on 100. The last time we did it, we landed on 105%, which is, which is pretty close. But the availability heuristic is invoked here because 
one of the reasons we might overestimate how much of the chores we do over how much of the chores other people do is we have a very vivid memory for when we do the chores. We were there. We were inside of our body looking out from it, watching ourselves do chores. We have the full memory for it, and this memory is available. We don't have that memory for when other people do chores. When your housemate does the chores, there's far less of a memory trace for you to pick up on. There may be some self-serving bias here, but we could also explain the overestimation of the proportion of household chores done by saying that both parties we asked have more available recall and more salient recall for the dishes that they did than the dishes that other people did. So when their brain says, okay, I'm going to list the times I did the dishes and the times that they did the dishes, and the brain realizes that it's easier to put examples into column A, the time that you did the dishes, it concludes, based in part on that ease, that you must do more dishes than you actually do. Again, it's not just that we can remember ourselves doing the dishes. It's that our brain says it's easier for us to remember the times we did the dishes than times other people did the dishes. Therefore, that ease must be relevant, so I'll conclude that I do the dishes more. That's the availability heuristic at work. Now, the availability heuristic is very broad, and it has lots of other heuristics and biases subsumed beneath it, or completely inside of it. So I mentioned saliency. There's a saliency bias. We tend to overweight cases that capture our attention and imagination. And in most models, first impression, where we consider it to be a bias, is subsumed under availability, i.e. you seem to continually be using and overweighting the initial early information you obtained. Now, heuristics are adaptive. We wouldn't last long without a nice quick and dirty system. One, they keep us alive, and that's why they're wired into us. The trouble they tend to get us into is mostly due to their oversimplification of reality. So their feature tends to be a bug in some occasions. But most of the time, it is a feature. Something else that our brain tends to do for us that we don't necessarily ask it to do and this is an heuristic or a process that is even more meta than the availability heuristic. In other words, the availability heuristic could be seen as one example of question swapping. Now we see this one all the time with politicians who are intentionally not saying anything but are you know, creating the posture of saying something so that it feels like they addressed or answered a question. But in that case, it's quite deliberate. Most of the time, when we question swap, we don't necessarily realize that we are not actually answering the initial question. So question swapping is, when we're asked a question, our system sees a similar, easier-to-answer question, so it answers that one instead. So your system one says, I've addressed questions like this before. Let's copy and paste the relevant similar solution, but it's not actually addressing the question or the challenge or the problem posed, it's addressing something simpler and something different. So in the case of asking who has more money, so we asked who has more money, our system said, well, I don't know who has more money, I've never heard of Arthur Chandler, so rather than actually address the question of who has more money, I'm going to say, who have I heard of, and I've heard of Donald Trump. And this is why the availability heuristic is subsumed under the more broad heuristic of question swapping. Another example, we often have to determine whether we trust people, whether they're bank tellers, salespeople, friends, relatives. But that's a big question. It would be very difficult to set a threshold for a trust decision in a way that actually addresses whether someone is worthy of trust. So we can farm the solution out to our very powerful and well-adapted affective system, and we can just ask the question instead, does this person make me feel good? And if we answer this swapped-in question, there's a fair chance we'll feel like we've addressed the first question of whether or not we can trust this person. Next, do I like this person from Toronto? If we think that their being from Toronto should be relevant to our liking them, or perhaps more realistically, if the fact that they are from Toronto is one of the very few facts that we know about them, we might swap the question, do I like this person, with, do I like people from Toronto? 
If we already have an answer for that swapped in question, sweet, we've saved ourselves some time. Here's a challenge that we had in the positive psychology literature. When we ask people questions like, how happy of a person are you? There are huge effects of current valence, i.e. people tend to swap out the question of how happy of a person are you, which is attempting to get at people's lifelong happiness, with the question, how do I feel right now? So they answer based on their current mood more so than their longer term mood which led positive psychologists to a whole bunch of clever methods, like experience sampling or randomly asking people how they feel over the course of the day. This is how we figured out that people are miserable when they watch television, at least compared to when they're doing things that are more productive, including even being at work. But let's get back into territory where we would need heuristics even more. How should tax evaders be punished? There's a whole bunch of things I know very little about, or even nothing about, that I would have to know something about in order to answer this question. What type of crime is tax evasion? How are other such crimes treated that are in the category of tax evasion? How common is the problem? What are people's general concerns or reasons why they evade taxation? I do not know enough to address this problem intelligently, and this is where the heuristics shine. We can once again turn to our trusty affective system and say, well, how angry does tax evasion make me feel? And if we manipulate that anger ever so subtly, people will give vastly different answers to the initial question. Despite the fact that how hangry you are right now is probably not relevant to setting legal precedent. So it's a very broad heuristic that contains several other more precise heuristics subsumed within it. But let's define the question swap heuristic. We will swap in simpler questions or problems to save time and energy. Sometimes we know we're doing this, sometimes we don't. Car ads figured out quite a few years ago that people don't address the logical problem of what they need in a car as thoroughly as they tend to think that they do. Even a giant decision that can be logically, rationally, systematically reasoned out, like what type of car you should buy and why, often appears to be in large part swapped for does this car make me feel good. I've been driving a Lincoln since long before anybody paid me to drive one. I didn't do it to be cool. I didn't do it to make a statement. I just liked it. Now's the perfect time for a test drive. Oh, what a feeling! Toyota. Another heuristic is anchoring. So we have question swapping as this kind of meta heuristic within which are subsumed availability and other heuristics. Within availability is further subsumed saliency and anchoring. In fact, first impression bias could be seen as subsumed within anchoring. An example of where anchoring influences decision making, which sign would sell more cans of soup? If you had a skid of soup and you were trying to sell some of it, you had the option of placing a sign above the soup that either says limit 12 per person, that's a lot of soup, or no limit per person. Here, the no limit per person option doesn't provide an anchor. You can't hang your hat on nothing. But limit 12 per person provides a pretty high anchor. Most people probably don't buy 12 cans of soup at a time. So our explanation for why the limit 12 per person sign sells more cans of soup is that 12 is a high number. And if you're deciding how many cans of soup to buy and you have 12, anchoring your initial decision, you'll buy more cans of soup than if you didn't have that high number anchoring your decision making. Another example from Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow is they had people guess how old Gandhi is, but before they asked how old was Gandhi when he died, they asked the question, was Gandhi more or less than and in one case they had, was he more or less than 144 years old when he died? 
Well, obviously, he was younger than 144 years old when he died. But that absurdly high anchor led people to estimate a higher age than if they had said was Gandhi more or less than 30 years old when he died. In other words, people's guesses as to how old Gandhi was when he died are influenced by the prior number of the first question. Kahneman used other examples too, like um, how tall is the tallest redwood in California? But before he would ask that question, he would ask a priming or an anchoring question, one of which was, is the height of the tallest redwood more or less than 1,200 feet? So that's a pretty high anchor. You're going to get, on average, people guessing to the second question, how tall is the highest redwood? They're going to guess higher values. The low anchor for that question was, is the height of the tallest redwood more or less than 180 feet? And then they'd ask, what's, the, what's your best guess as to the height of the tallest redwood? So if you were in the 180 feet condition, you, as a group with, with other individuals, would have an average that's far lower for your guess for the, for the tallest redwood, and the group anchored on 1,200 would have a higher estimate. So anchoring, or the anchoring heuristic, is the observation that our judgments can be pulled toward recently perceived irrelevant magnitudes and quantities. In the three examples provided so far, the quantities provided as anchors weren't necessarily irrelevant. What I find most interesting about studies in anchoring is that sometimes the anchor can be completely arbitrary. If you've been recently asked what the date is, and it's a high number, and then right after you have to figure out how many bananas you're going to buy, you will tend to buy more bananas if you responded with the higher number date. Here, the only connection is that the 18th is a number and bananas come in quantities. Since that example just seems silly, here's one that you've actually encountered up to 50% off. Well, up to 50% off, that sounds great. 50% off is a lot off. That's a great sale. But of course, it's up to 50% off. You anchor on the 50%, and really, they only need one item in the store that is 50% off in order to put this sign up. But it's an initial anchor that will get you to think, oh, this is a good sale. Lots of students in their assignments come up with really good examples for anchoring. It's not too difficult. What I want to emphasize is that anchoring can be the result of 100% arbitrary numbers that you recently heard. So in one study, we got German judges to all read a case about a shoplifter. So they all read the same case, and then they had to come to a decision regarding sentencing. But what we did was we had them roll a die, or rather two dice, that were loaded before coming to their decision. The loaded dice would produce either a 3 or a 9. So essentially we were randomizing the judges to either experience the number 3 or the number 9 before coming to their determination of the sentence of the shoplifter. Did we find a difference between the two groups? The groups that rolled the three produced an average sentence for the shoplifter of five months. The group that rolled the nine produced an average sentence for the shoplifter of eight months. That's quite a big difference, and what I want to emphasize is that the dice had nothing to do with the decision. It wasn't a relevant quantity. At least when we primed people with the idea that maybe Gandhi was 144, at least that was you know loosely relevant to the decision that they made. But is our need for heuristics not somewhat reduced by the fact that there's Google? By the fact that we can just look up who Lelaine Betancourt is? Well, yes and no. For simple questions like how rich is Lelaine Betancourt or was Lelaine Betancourt, Google's going to do a good job. For more nuanced questions, for which we might have to rely a little more on heuristics, Google could simply be enhancing whatever biases we already have. So there's three main ways that we can say Google facilitates your bias. That is, Google enhances your prior leanings rather than informing them or potentially being corrective of them. The first problem, or the first way that Google enhances confirmation bias, is that you, not Google, you decide when you stop your search. So let's do a little thought experiment. Let's imagine we travel back in time and we get to talk to Socrates. And let's say we're telling him about the future and how 
there is something like the Oracle of Delphi that can answer any question that you have. It has the world's knowledge in it, and it can answer any question that you have. So Socrates will, of course, be very interested in this, and he'll start to question us about what it does, how it works. And one thing that will be revealed in his questioning is that rather than giving you a single answer to your question, the Google Oracle gives you hundreds, thousands, perhaps millions of possible answers from which you get to pick. I'm pretty sure that Socrates would be able to see and point out to us that this is not necessarily a vehicle for learning or wisdom, but more of a menu from which we may pick our favorite answer. Vaccines cause autism? Well, I have one million results that say they don't, and one result that says they do. I knew it. Just because I have it doesn't mean it's true! A second way that Google can amplify your confirmation bias is it responds to the way that you ask questions. Now this is in part because Google has been trying to get more intuitive. It bases its results not just on pure search regarding the terms that you use, but on the intent it perceives you to have. So you can go ahead and ask Google a biased question. I asked it, how does marijuana cure cancer? And in my top three results, I had mainstream media finally admits it, cannabis can cure cancer. And just in case there's any true believers of that listening, let's pick something you probably don't believe. How can cigarettes cure cancer? Surely this will not give me results in the top five that give me an answer confirming the latent idea that cigarettes can cure cancer. Well, actually, it gave me two. Clinic claims that smoking cures cancer and emphysema. 11 days late for April Fools, Fox News. And smoking helps protect against lung cancer. The third way that Google could potentially enhance confirmation bias is it tailors a search to you based on your location, based on searches like yours, based on its increasing store of relevant information. You can run a pretty simple comparison by typing the same thing into Google as you do into DuckDuckGo. Well, Google uses information about you. DuckDuckGo ignores these things like your location, your click history, your login. So you'll get different results between Google and DuckDuckGo. The extent to which Google tailors your actual search results to you is a matter of debate, but we know that search is tailored such as in China, where search results for Tiananmen Square are filtered. So the warning here is that Google, rather than teaching us something, could simply recapitulate or reaffirm whatever biases we previously had, turning up the dial on our confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is two things. It's the tendency to seek and find what supports your beliefs, and the tendency to not notice or even to actively explain away things that could disconfirm your beliefs. Rebecca, if there's anything wrong with my feelings for Dolores, just give me a sign. No. On the lookout for it. One thing we can do when we're confronted with a belief, such as a superstition, is we can map out reality to remind ourselves that there may be disconfirming cases that could prove our belief or our superstition unwarranted or inaccurate. So Sidney Crosby has various superstitions and rituals that he engages in, or at least has engaged in. He used to eat the same type of peanut butter sandwich with the same type of peanut butter and jelly in the same place with the same person before games. And this is a snippet from a USA Today story saying he had a new superstition, which was he couldn't speak to his mom or his sister on game days because when he does, he gets injured. What we can do with something like this is we could map out reality. So I assume we have records of when he was injured, and we might be able to piece together whether he saw or did not see his family members on those days as well. So this would create four different types of events. 
There's cell A, events where he saw his family and he got injured. There's cell B, events where he got injured but he didn't see his family. Cell C, events where he didn't get injured but he did see his family. And cell D, events where he did not get injured and he did not see his family. Now by confirmation bias, we're aware of which cell or cells Sidney Crosby is likely to pay attention to and remember. Specifically, cell A will get lots of attention, as well as maybe cell D, but he'll be likely to ignore or explain away, explain away instances of cells B and C. Those are events that could disconfirm his superstition that he gets injured when he sees family before games. There seemed to be no way out of the financial struggle. Until one Sunday morning, the Johnson's pastor taught about the importance of tithing and giving. And then he made an offer too good to refuse. If you will commit to tithe 10% of your income, if in that time you don't see a difference in your income, then he would refund every dime we've given. We were kind of looking at each other thinking, who does that? He must really have a lot of faith in what he's saying. Me and my husband were in church together that day, and he has, you know, looked at me and I looked at him, and he's like, what have we got to lose? In the past, the couple occasionally gave to their church and to CBN. But tithing 10% of their income was challenging, even with a guaranteed refund. 10% of your income is a lot of money. 10% is, um, is a light bill. 10% is a car payment. When we started out tithing, we didn't see immediate results. I had to quit thinking with my mind. I had to quit thinking with my mind. And I had to just believe that God is true to what he says. Six months later, Sue Ellen says the changes were undeniable. First, Gene's company restored overtime then they sold a piece of land under nearly impossible conditions. And the first thing the Johnsons did with their profit? We took the money from that sale of the land, and 10% of that, we tithed that too. Another word for superstition, or another term, is illusory correlation. Sidney Crosby somehow came to the conclusion that his injuries were tied to him seeing his mother and sister. And once that illusory correlation was inferred, then confirmation bias allows you to recall or see or interpret other instances as confirming the case. Briefly mentioned was priming. So priming is keeping some idea or feeling active in someone's mind. So that this activation can color their experience or acting, their behavior. Someone thinking about all the ways they might incorrectly perform a complex task might be contributing to their own failure by focusing on the things that they shouldn't do rather than their optimal performance. This is the premise behind some sports coaching as you visualize your ideal game and it's also the idea behind lots of advertising. Why do Coca-Cola and Pepsi still need to advertise? They're giant companies. Well, it's in part because they are working with a peripheral persuasion technique, because there's no good central persuasion route for convincing people to drink sugar water. But it's also because the sale of sugar water has a lot to do with, if I keep active in your mind, the idea that Coca-Cola is refreshing, that it can give you energy or satisfaction, or that it represents a break from stress or adult responsibilities, Eventually you might believe this and indulge, but of course you already know how advertising works. What may be less intuitive is that advertisement for Coca-Cola is also a positive for Pepsi. If I'm advertising Coke, I'm advertising the idea of drinking sugar water for satisfaction. I am also less directly advertising the idea that you need to purchase something if you want to drink a liquid. In this way, advertising Coke or Pepsi can increase my likelihood of of choosing bottled water over tap water. This brings us to the key observation about priming, which is for priming to influence you in a given direction or toward a given idea, the prime only needs to activate part of that idea's network or part of a category that that idea belongs to. In other words, to get someone to move in a given direction or make a certain choice, you only need to get them seeing or thinking something loosely related to that choice. An example that was made popular by Robert Cialdini in his book Persuasion is a study that looked at whether seeing this, a background containing clouds, versus this, a background containing pennies, would make undergraduate research participants more or less likely to click on and spend time at these links to 
price versus comfort. This was consumer research, and the undergraduates were posing as people interested in purchasing couches. The researchers tracked their behavior, and it turns out that the different primes to which they were randomized, so half were randomly assigned to be the penny prime, and half were randomly assigned to be the cloud prime, exposure to these primes influenced the research, or the clicking, and navigation done by these research participants. Note that the initial prime is on a separate web page, and once you click through, there's no more background. So there's an initial prime at the very beginning of the process, and then there's nothing. And this initial prime was enough to get research participants in the penny prime condition to spend more than twice as much time looking at pricing information, and individuals in the cloud condition to spend significantly more time looking at comfort information. This is the beauty and the art of priming. If you can figure out what is thematically apt, what is poetically relevant for keeping people in the mind frame that you want, then you can guide their behavior and their thoughts with the smallest and subtlest of primes. A cloud for comfort, a penny for money, or a phrase in the right context. Oh, fix auto! The first word that should come to mind after an accident. Or a description in the right context. Hurt in a car? Call William Attar. 444-4444. Now let's take a look at one more study involving priming, and then we'll look at three more things that your brain does. This next study comes to us courtesy of forensic psychology. Corva and colleagues wanted to see whether images of people's faces would influence decisions people made as mock jurors evaluating a trial. Firstly, they needed some stimuli. They needed faces that were typically rated trustworthy and faces that were typically rated untrustworthy. And this is easy enough to assemble. One simply gets a whole bunch of pictures of faces and asks research participants to rate how trustworthy these faces look. It actually only takes one-tenth of a second to come to their determination of whether the face looks trustworthy. In other words, if we give individuals more time to look at the face, they don't come to a different conclusion. So Corva and colleagues ran what they called an initial pilot study, which was just to establish their stimuli. In other words, to get a bunch of faces that people typically rate or respond to as trustworthy, and a bunch of faces that people typically respond to as less trustworthy. And the beauty is, even people who are rating everyone as trustworthy, unless they're consistently rating the maximum amount of trustworthiness, they're still going to have some variation in their scores. So let's say you're very nice and you rate nearly everyone as trustworthy. So let's say you have a scale from 1 to 10 and the least trustworthy person that you ranked was a 7. And you ranked a bunch of people as 10. Even though you're saying that everyone looks trustworthy, you still have some range in your scores. In other words, these are relative scorings, not absolute scorings. Someone doesn't have to be rated as actually untrustworthy to be relatively untrustworthy, according to the rating system. In our example, we had someone who was a 7. Now, 7 out of 10 is quite trustworthy, but that person is relatively untrustworthy, or is the least trustworthy person, according to this rater. The researchers are running this initial pilot study because we know from decades of prior research that if you give one sample a bunch of faces to rate according to their trustworthiness, then the next sample that you give the same faces to will typically give very similar results. Individuals in the bottom third of trustworthiness or of relative trustworthiness for the first sample of raters will typically also be in the bottom third of trustworthiness for the next set of raters. So that was step one. And in our discussion about first impressions, we've already touched on what is behind these ratings of trustworthiness. So if you have a more symmetrical face, you'll be seen as more trustworthy. If you have a face more like a baby's, you'll be seen as more trustworthy. 
and people's trustworthiness ratings will strongly be correlated with their perceived attractiveness of the person that they're rating, the kindness that they perceive in the face of the person they're rating, the aggressiveness and potential to commit a crime. Step two is to get a second bunch of research participants. So the first bunch was just part of the pilot study in order to establish our stimuli. We take the highest trustworthy rated faces and keep them, and we take the lowest trustworthy faces and we keep them, and we throw out the middle third. So this new set of participants, now that we have stimuli for them, are going to tell us a whole bunch of things about themselves. They're going to fill out special surveys and questionnaires, assessing their level of confidence in the justice system, their vengeance emotion, their level of racial bias, and their scores in terms of social justice orientation and fairness orientation. I should note here that of the 98 participants in the study, 79 were female, in part because it's psychology undergrad. Step three is when the participants are actually engaging in the task that we're curious about. So they, as pretend jurors, get to read a file, and they have to come to a decision about the case. There were four different types of cases. So there were two serious crime vignettes, one that was a, a robbery and a murder, and the other one was a violent attack resulting in murder. And there were two less serious crime vignettes of car theft and fraud. For each of these vignettes, there were 11 pieces of evidence that constituted the case against the individual or all of the facts that were tried. But in all cases, the 11th point, the last point, was what the authors called thoroughly exonerating. So one example of these thoroughly exonerating statements is DNA evidence from underneath one of the victim's fingernails did not match the accused. So that is thoroughly exonerating. That certainly would throw reasonable doubt into, the, into play here. In other words, for every case, the decision that all participants should come to is that the individual is not guilty of the crime. All faces, all individuals should be found innocent. They are all innocent faces. Moreover, when they are deliberating, we have on a screen in front of them a reminder of how reasonable doubt works. But of course we know that there's going to be tons of mistakes made, in part because of those other 10 evidentiary points that might work to convince people that there is a case against the individual, despite that one thoroughly exonerating bit of evidence. Of all the variables that were measured and manipulated, what predicted people incorrectly finding the individuals guilty? The severity of the crime didn't have an effect. So whether it was the two serious or the two less serious crimes, there wasn't a significant difference in the number of errors made. The gender of the face also did not seem to make a difference. In other words, people are not more likely to find females guilty or females innocent compared to males, at least in this sample. Regarding the variables that we measured with our surveys earlier, if individuals had more confidence in the justice system, then they were more likely to find untrustworthy looking faces guilty. Those higher in vengeance emotion were also more likely to find untrustworthy looking faces guilty. Those higher, relatively, in racial bias were, rather predictably, more likely to find untrustworthy looking faces guilty. So if you are very low in racial bias, you have about a 20% chance of finding the untrustworthy looking faces guilty. Whereas if you are very, very high in racial bias, at least relatively, according to this scale, then you are nearly 80% likely to find an untrustworthy looking face guilty. But of course, there's a flip side to this, which is that those higher in racial bias are more likely to make more accurate predictions regarding trustworthy looking faces. As your racial bias increases, you are less likely to incorrectly find the trustworthy looking faces guilty. And the authors make a point of noting here that all of the stimuli, all of the faces that they use in their stimuli were white. This was in order to avoid confounding with racial bias. 
So they make the note that this wouldn't have been racism. It would have been the superordinate category of racism, which is judging a book by its cover. Those higher in racial bias are more likely to make the error of judging a book by its cover. Or in the author's words, a more general tendency to make unfounded inferences about defendants. What about a different type of software? What about higher social justice orientation or higher fairness orientation? Well, this group is making more accurate decisions regarding untrustworthy looking faces as their social justice or fairness orientation level increases. So they go from roughly 80% likely, those on the low end of social justice slash fairness, or at least the relative low end of it, have about an 80% chance of finding an untrustworthy looking face guilty. But as you get higher in the scale, up to the highest, you get down to somewhere between 30 and 40% likely to find the untrustworthy looking face guilty. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows because those with higher social justice or fairness orientation were more likely to find trustworthy looking faces guilty, going from roughly 35% likely to 45 or 50% likely. In the author's own words about those with higher fairness orientation, individuals who strive for objectivity may overcompensate in an, in an attempt to make a fair and unbiased decision. These individuals may be overly conscious of the need for objectivity in legal decisions, which may be potentially biasing their verdicts in the opposite direction. So all of the faces should have been found innocent. They all had one thoroughly exonerating detail. Appearance, in actuality, was not related to guilt or innocence, so it should not have been related to decisions, but it was found across all conditions to be influencing. Even those with high fairness orientation were influenced by the faces, by their assessment of how trustworthy the faces looked. It should have been irrelevant. It should have been treated as irrelevant, but it was not. Those running racially biased software were more likely to wrongly convict untrustworthy looking people as their racial bias increased, but as their racial bias increased, they were less likely to find trustworthy looking people guilty. And those with higher social justice orientation tended to wrongly convict trustworthy looking people as their orientation increased, but they did much better as their orientation increased in reducing their error regarding untrustworthy looking people. In the author's own words, Untrustworthy faces activate personal biases related to the importance of appearance-based assessments in legal decisions. The subsequent tunnel vision reduces the likelihood that exonerating evidence will be considered in evaluation of guilt or innocence, which may ultimately contribute to wrongful convictions. And this is regardless of the type of software you're running. Even those who specifically make an ethic of being fair and just are influenced by the faces that they see. In addition to making a similar rate of errors, they were similarly prone to make their own type of errors. In other words, nobody escaped the power of the prime. The faces they saw, their symmetry, their baby-facedness influenced everybody because we are all human. We are influenced by irrelevancies like a picture in the corner of a page and even what might be called the more enlightened of our philosophies, the more compassionate, the more deliberately fairness-seeking of our philosophies can't entirely avoid these simple priming-based influences. So, three more things that your brain does. First, it chains heuristics together. One of the reasons it can be so difficult to trace back how we came to an incorrect conclusion or how we made a given thinking error is that our brains tend not to just use one heuristic at a time. Oftentimes, we'll link them together. So we just had the question of, is this person guilty? And you had to read 11 things, and the 11th thing should make you conclude, no, they're not guilty. So you have everything you need for your system two to figure out whether the person is guilty or not. But it seems like at least on an implicit accidental level, individuals are swapping out the question of, is this person guilty for the question, do they look guilty? And again, this is implicit. People are not consciously doing this. Their system one is doing this and the system two is failing to check what system one is recommending. So you can come to one of two conclusions about the guilt of the individual. You can say, yes, they look guilty, or you can say, no, they look guilty. 
But at this point, whatever personal software you happen to be running is going to determine the direction of your errors that you're going to make, because you are going to make errors. So let's just call the second heuristic your personal bias. If your personal bias is a racial one, i.e. you judge things by their covers, then an initial answer of yes to the swapped in question, do they look guilty, would result in your being biased toward calling the individual guilty. Now let's say you came to the conclusion of no, you said this, these, this person does not look guilty, but you happen to be running social justice or fairness orientation software, which jumps in and says, hey, maybe I'm biased against this person because they look more innocent. I'm going to make an adjustment here and more strongly consider that they may in fact be guilty. So you're more likely to land on guilty. What the first heuristic results in is going to depend on your personal bias. Next, the conjunction fallacy. Maybe you have met Linda before. Linda is 31 years old. She's single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination, social justice, and she also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Which of the following is more probable? In other words, which of the following is more likely to be true? If you had to bet on one of them, which is more likely to be true? Linda is a bank teller or that Linda is a bank teller and a feminist. What do you think? The quickest way to get at the solution to the Linda problem is the fact that there can't be more feminist bank tellers than there are bank tellers. If all bank tellers are feminist, then there are an equal number of bank tellers and feminist bank tellers. But realistically, feminist bank tellers will be a subset of bank tellers. We could illustrate this with a Venn diagram. So we have A, which is all feminists, we have B, which is all bank tellers, and then we have the overlap in the middle here, which is all feminist bank tellers. Despite the fact that the vast majority of people we ask the Linda question to tell us that it's more likely that Linda is a feminist bank teller than just a bank teller, it's pretty plain to see that it is not correct to say it's more likely that she is a feminist bank teller than a bank teller. It fits more with her story, it's more plausible, but it's certainly not more likely that she is two things than that she is just one of those things. The conjunction fallacy is the fallacy of thinking that a less probable thing is the more likely thing because this less probable thing happens to tell a better story. It's also called plausibility versus probability. Something is more plausible if it tells a more convincing story, but in telling a more convincing story, it may bring in additional details that are decreasingly likely, and therefore the more convincing or plausible story may be less likely to be true by virtue of making an excess of predictions or inferences. Now the conjunction fallacy is, like many other mistakes that we make in thinking one example of a category type of mistake. One example of a rule that your brain seems to follow quite often is use of your knowledge of what category a thing belongs to in your concluding what to do, feel, or think about that thing. Uh, I'm sorry, are you here to see me? No, silly. I go here. You, you go where? Harvard. Law school. You got into Harvard Law? What, like it's hard? Oh my gosh, Warner, it's gonna be so great. I'm planning this great mixer, you totally have to help me. I'm thinking like a luau, or maybe like casino night. This is gonna be just like senior year, except for funner. Uh -huh. Oh, uh, time to go, I have to go to class. The male character here is having trouble reconciling his expectations about Elle Woods with the reality. He has put her in a category, and he expects that category to be representative of her. He does not expect stereotypical, perky, ditzy blondes to be lawyers, so he has trouble comprehending that L could be a lawyer. It's a good heuristic. You don't expect a fish to climb a tree, because you know things about fish, and you know things about trees. But especially when it comes to people, a lot of the categories are no substitute for a better understanding of the individual. In the next few lectures, we'll be seeing more of representativeness and the other cool things that your brain does, whether you want it to or need it to or not. 
This lecture gave us a bunch of new concepts, any of which would work for the written assignment, the purpose of which is just to find examples of any of these concepts from your real life or from the fiction that you encounter in your real life. Explain the concept, explain how the example you found is a good representation of the concept, and repeat four more times with four other concepts. As the course progresses, we'll have more thinking tools and hopefully more chances to see how they stack up against each other as explanations. More coming soon. Stay tuned.